the last American, J. A. Mitchell, to those thoughtful Persians W. H. O. can read a warning in the sudden rise and swift extinction of a foolish people this volume is dedicated, a few words by headful surnamed the Axis of Wisdom Curator of the Imperial Museum at Shiraz, author of The Celestial Conquest of California, and of Northern America under the Hibernian Rulers. The astounding discoveries of Khan Lee of dim future have thrown floods of light upon the domestic life of the American people. He little realized when he landed upon that sleeping continent what a service he was about to render history, or what enthusiasm his discoveries would arouse among Persian archaeologists, every student of antiquity is familiar with these facts. But for the benefit of those who have yet to acquire a knowledge of this extraordinary people, I advise, first, a visit to the museum at Tehran in order to excite their interest in the subject, and second, the reading of such books as Nofuel's What We Found in the West, and Nozanal's History of the Americans. The last named is a complete and reliable history of these people from the birth of the Republic under George Washington to the year 1990, when they ceased to exist as a nation. I must say, however, that Nozanal leaves the reader much confused concerning the period between the massacre of the Protestants in 1927, and the overflow of the Murphy dynasty in 1940, he holds the opinion with many other historians that the Americans were a mongrel race, with little or no patriotism, and were purely imitative, simply an enlarged copy of other nationalities extant at the time. He pronounces them a shallow, nervous, extravagant people, and accords them but few redeeming virtues. This, of course, is just, but nevertheless they will always be an interesting study by reason of their rapid growth, their vast numbers their marvellous mechanical ingenuity and their sudden and almost unaccountable disappearance, the wealth, luxury, and gradual decline of the native population, the frightful climatic changes which swept the country like a mower's scythe, the rapid conversion of a vast continent, alive with millions of pleasure-loving people, into a silent wilderness, where the sun and moon look down in turn upon hundreds of weed-grown cities, comma, all this is told by Nozanar with force and accuracy, here's truth. Tis a bitter pill but good physic. Aboard this low tub in the year 2951, 10th May, there is land ahead, Grip till La was first to see it, and when he shouted the tidings my heart beat fast with joy. The famished crew have forgotten their disconsolate stomachs and are dancing about the deck. Tis not I, forsooth, who shall restrain them. A month of emptiness upon a heavy sea is preparation for any folly. Nofiel alone is without enthusiasm. The old man's heart seems dead. We can see the land plainly, a dim strip along the western horizon. A fair wind blows from the northeast, but we get on with cruel hindrance, for the slow tub is a heavy ship, her bluff bow and voluminous bottom ill fitting her for speed. 11th May, sighted a fine harbour this afternoon, and are now at anchor in it. Grip till La thinks we have reached one islands mentioned by Benabout. Nofuel, however, is sure we are further north. 12th May, what a change has come over Nofuel. He is the youngest man aboard. We all share his delight, as our discoveries are truly marvellous. This morning while I was yet in my bunk he ran into the cabin and, forgetting our difference in rank, seized me by the arm and tried to drag me out. His excitement so had the better of him that I captured little meaning from his words. Hastening after him, however, I was amazed to see such ancient limb transport a man so rapidly. He skipped up the narrow stairs like a heffrand, young though I am, it was faster than I could follow. But what a sight when I reached the deck. We saw nothing of it yesterday, for the dusk of evening was already closing about us when we anchored, right ahead, in the middle of the bay, towered a gigantic statue, many times higher than the masts of our ship. Beyond, from behind this statue, came the broad river upon whose waters we were floating, its surface all lay glitter with the rising sun. To the east, where Nofuel was pointing, his fingers trembling with excitement, lay the ruins of an endless city. It stretched far away into the land beyond, further even than our eyes could see. And in the smaller river on the right stood two colossal structures, rising high in the air, and standing like twin brothers, as if to guard the deserted streets beneath. Not a sound reached us not a floating thing disturbed the surface of the water. Verily, it seemed the sleep of death, I was lost in wonder, as we looked, a strange bird, like a heron, arose with a hoarse cry from the foot of the great image and flew toward the city, what does it all mean? I cried. Where are we, where indeed? said Nofuel. If I knew but that, O oh Prince, I could tell the rest. No traveller has mentioned these ruins. Persian history contains no record of such a people. Allah has decreed that we discover a forgotten world. Within an hour we landed, and found ourselves in an ancient street, the pavements covered with weeds, grass, 
and flowers, all crowding together in wild neglect. Huge trees of great antiquity thrust their limbs through windows and roofs and produced a mournful sight. They gave a welcome shade, however, as we find the heat ashore of a roasting quality most hard to bear. The curious buildings on either side are wonderfully preserved, even sheets of glass still standing in many of the iron window frames. We wandered along through the thick grass, Nofuel and I, much excited over our discoveries and delighted with the strange scene. The sunshine is of dazzling brightness, birds are singing everywhere, and the ruins are gay with gorgeous wild flowers. We soon found ourselves in what was once a public square, now for the most part a shady grove. Afterward ascertained to be the square of the city hall, as we sat on a fallen cornice and gazed on the lofty buildings about us I asked Nofuel if he was still in ignorance as to where we were. And he said, as yet I know not. The architecture is much like that of ancient Europe, but it tells us nothing. Then I said to him in jest, Let this teach us, O Nofuel, the folly of excessive wisdom. Who among thy pupils of the Imperial College at Ispahan would believe their venerable instructor in history and languages could visit the largest city in the world and know so little about it? Thy words are wise, my prince, he answered, few babes could know less. As we were leaving this grove my eyes fell upon an upturned slab that seemed to have a meaning. It was lying at our feet, partly hidden by the tall grass, having fallen from the columns that supported it. Upon its surface were strange characters in bold relief, as sharp and clear as when chiseled ten centuries ago. I pointed it out to Nofuel, and we bent over it with eager eyes, it was this. Aster House. The inscription is Old English, he said. House signified a dwelling, but the word Aster I know not. It was probably the name of a deity, and here was his temple, this was encouraging, and we looked about eagerly for other signs, our steps soon brought us into another street, and as we walked I expressed my surprise at the wonderful preservation of the stone work, which looked as though cut but yesterday, in such an atmosphere decay is slow, said Nofuel. A thousand years at least have passed since these houses were occupied. Take yonder oak, for instance. The tree itself has been growing for at least a hundred years and we know from the fallen mass beneath it that centuries had gone by before its birth was possible, he stopped speaking, his eyes fixed upon an inscription over a doorway, partly hidden by one of the branches of the oak, turning suddenly upon me with a look of triumph, he exclaimed, it is ours, what is ours? I asked, the knowledge we sought, and he pointed to the inscription, New York Stock EXC, he was tremulous with joy, thou hast heard of New York, O oh my prince, I answered that I had read of it at school, thou art in it now. He said. We are standing on the western continent. Little wonder we thought our voyage long, and what was New York? I asked. I read of it at college, but remember little. Was it not the capital of the ancient Americans? Not the capital, he answered, but their largest city. Its population was four millions, four millions. I exclaimed. Verily, O oh fountain of wisdom that is many for one city, such is history, my prince. Moreover, as thou knowest, it would take us many days to walk this town, true, it is endless, he continued thus. Strange that a single word can tell so much. Those iron structures, the huge statue in the harbour, the temples with pointed towers, all are as writ in history, whereupon I repeated that I knew little of Americans save what I had learned at college, a perfunctory and fleeting knowledge, as they were a people who interested me but little. Let us seat ourselves in the shade, said Nofuel, and I will tell thee of them, we sat. For eleven centuries the cities of this sleeping hemisphere have decayed in solitude. Their very existence has been forgotten. The people who built them have long since passed away, and their civilization is but a shadowy tradition. Historians are astounded that a nation of an hundred million beings should vanish from the earth like a mist, and leave so little behind. But to those familiar with their lives and character surprise is impossible. There was nothing to leave. The Americans possessed neither literature, art, nor music of their own. Everything was borrowed. The very clothes they wore were copied with ludicrous precision from the models of other nations. They were a sharp, restless, quick-witted, greedy race, given body and soul to the gathering of riches. Their chiefest passion was to buy and sell. Even women, both of high and low degree, spent much of their time at bargains, crowding and jostling each other in vast marts of trade, for their attire was complicated and demanded most of their time, how degrading! I exclaimed, so it must have been, said Nofuel, but they were not without virtues. Their domestic life was happy. A man had but one wife, and treated her as his equal, that is curious. But as I remember, they were a people of elastic honor, they were so considered, 
said Nofuel, their commercial honor was a jest. They were sharper than the Turks. Prosperity was their god, with cunning and invention for his prophets. Their restless activity no Persian can comprehend. This vast country was alive with noisy industries, the nervous Americans darting with inconceivable rapidity from one city to another by a system of locomotion we can only guess at. There existed roads with iron rods upon them, over which small houses on wheels were drawn with such velocity that a long day's journey was accomplished in an hour. Enormous ships without sails, driven by a mysterious force, bore hundreds of people at a time to the farthermost points of the earth, and are these things lost? I asked. We know many of the forces, said Nofuel, but the knowledge, of applying them is gone. The very elements seem to have been their slaves. Cities were illuminated at night by artificial moons, whose radiance eclipsed the moon above. Strange devices were in use by which they conversed together when separated by a journey of many days. Some of these appliances exist today in Persian museums. The superstitions of our ancestors allowed their secrets to be lost during those dark centuries from which at last we are waking. At this point we heard the voice of Bozak has in the distance, they had found a spring and he was calling to us, such heat we had never felt, and it grew hotter each hour. Near the river where we ate it was more comfortable, but even there the perspiration stood upon us in great drops. Our faces shone like fishes. It was our wish to explore further, but the streets were like ovens, and we returned to the Zlo tub, as I sat upon the deck this afternoon recording the events of the morning in this journal Bozak has and Adelpate approached asking permission to take the small boat and visit the great statue. Thereupon Nofuel informed us that this statue in ancient times held a lofted torch illuminating the whole harbour, and he requested Adel Pate to try and discover how the light was accomplished. They returned toward evening with this information, that the statue is not of solid bronze, but hollow, that they ascended by means of an iron stairway into the head of the image, and from the trop looked down upon us, that Adel Pate, in the dark, sat to rest himself upon a nest of yellow flies with black stripes, that these flies inserted stings into Adel Pate's person, causing him to exclaim loudly and descend the stairs with unexpected agility, that Bozak has and the others pushed on through the upraised arm, and stood at last upon the bronze torch itself, that the city lay beneath them like a map, covering the country for miles away on both sides of the river. As for illuminating the harbour, Bozak has says no fuel is mistaken. There are no vestiges of anything that could give a light no vessel for royal or traces of fire. Nofuel says Akaz is an idiot, that he shall go himself. 13th May. A startling discovery this morning. By landing higher up the river we explored a part of the city where the buildings are of a different character from those we saw yesterday. Nofuel considers them the dwellings of the rich. In shape they are like bricks set on end, all very similar, uninteresting, and monotonous. We noticed one where the doors and shutters were still in place but rotting from the fantastic hinges that supported them. A few hard blows brought down the outer doors in a dusty heap, and as we stepped upon the marble floor within our eyes met an unexpected sight. Furniture, statues, dingy pictures in crumbling frames, images in bronze and silver, mirrors, curtains, all weather, but in every condition of decay. We knocked open the iron shutters and let the light into the rooms sealed up for centuries. In the first one lay a rug from Persia. Faded, moth-eaten gone in places, it seemed to ask us with dying eyes to be taken hence. My heart grew soft over the ancient rug, and I caught a foolish look in level-headed eye. As we climbed the mouldering stair to the floor above I expressed surprise that cloth and woodwork should hold together for so many centuries, also saying. These Americans were not so unworthy as we think them, that may be, said level-headed. But the Persian rug is far the freshest object we have seen, and that perchance was ancient when they bought it. On this floor we entered a dim chamber, spacious and once richly furnished. When level-headed pushed open the shutters and drew aside the ragged curtains we started at the sight before us. Upon a wide bed in the center of the room lay a human form, the long, yellow hair still clinging to the head. It was more a mummy than a skeleton. Around, upon the bed, lay moldering fragments of the once white sheets that covered it. On the fingers of the left hand glistened two rings which drew our attention. One held a diamond of great price. The other was composed of sapphires and diamonds most curiously arranged. We stood a moment in silence, gazing sadly upon the figure, poor woman, I said, left thus to die alone, it is more probable, said Nofuel, she was already dead, and her friends, departing perhaps in haste, were unable to burn the body, did they burn their dead? I asked. In my history it was writ they buried them in the earth like potatoes, and left them to rot, and Nofuel answered, at one time it was so, but later on. As they became more civilized, the custom was abandoned. 
Is it possible? I asked, that this woman has been lying here almost a thousand years and yet so well preserved? I, also, am surprised, said Nofuel. I can only account for it by the extreme dryness of the air in absorbing the juices of the body and retarding decay, then lifting tenderly in his hand some of the yellow hair, he said. She was probably very young, scarce twenty, were there women fair? I asked. They were beautiful, he answered, with graceful forms and lovely faces, a pleasure to the eye, also were they gay and sprightly with much animation, thereupon cried level headed. Here are the first words thou hast uttered, O Nofuel, that cause me to regret the extinction of this people. There is ever a place in my heart for a blushing maiden, then let thy grief be of short life, responded Nofuel, for American damsels were not of that description. Blushing was an art they practiced little. The shyness thou so lovest in a Persian maiden was to them an unknown thing. Our shrinking daughters bear no resemblance to these western products. They strode the public streets with roving eyes and unblushing faces, holding free converse with men as with women, bold of speech and free of manner, going and coming as it pleased them best. They knew much of the world, managed their own affairs, and devised their own marriages, often changing their minds and marrying another than the betrothed, Bismillah. And men could love these things? exclaimed level-headed with much feeling, so it appears, but I should say the American bride had much the freshness of a dried figure, so she had, said Nofuel, but those who know only the dried fig have no regret for the fresh fruit. But the fault was not with the maidens. Brought up like boys, with the same studies and mental development, the womanly part of their nature gradually vanished as their minds expanded. Vigor of intellect was the object of a woman's education, then level-headed exclaimed with great disgust. Praises be to Allah for his aid in exterminating such a people. And he walked away from the bed, and began looking about the chamber. In a moment he hastened back to us, saying, Here are more jewels. Also money, Nofu legally took the pieces, money. He cried. Money will tell us more than pages of history, there were silver coins of different sizes and two small pieces of copper. Nofu studied them closely. The latest date is 1957, he said, a little less than a thousand years ago but the piece may have been in circulation some years before this woman died, also it may have been coined the very year of her death. It bears the head of Dennis, the last of the Hibernian dictators. The race is supposed to have become extinct before 1990 of their era, I then said. Thou hast never told us, O oh Nofuel. The cause of their disappearance? There were many causes, he answered. The Americans themselves were of English origin, but people from all parts of Europe came here in vast numbers. Although the original comers were vigorous and hardy the effect of climate upon succeeding generations was fatal. They became flat-chested and thin, with scanty hair, fragile teeth, and weak digestions. Nervous diseases unknown to us wrought deadly havoc. Children were reared with difficulty. Between 1945 and 1960, the last census of which any record remains, the population decreased from 90 millions to less than 12 millions. Climatic changes, the like of which no other land ever experienced, began at that period, and finished in less than ten years a work made easy by nervous natures and rapid lives. The temperature would skip in a single day from burning heat to winter's cold. No constitution could withstand it, and this vast continent became once more an empty wilderness, much more of the same nature he told us, but I am too sleepy to write longer. We explored the rest of the mansion, finding many things of interest. I caused several objects to be carried aboard the Zlo tub. These objects are now in the Museum of the Imperial College, at Tehran, 14th May, hotter than yesterday, in the afternoon we were rowed up the river and landed for a short walk. It is unsafe to brave the sun, the more I learn of these Americans the less interesting they become. Nofuel is of much the same mind, judging from our conversation today, as we walked along together. It was in this wise. Khan Lee, how I like the houses. How monotonous. Nofuel, so, also, were the occupants. They thought alike, worked alike, ate, dressed and conversed alike. They read the same books, they fashioned their garments as directed, with no regard for the size or figure of the individual, and copied to a stitch the fashions of Europeans, Khan Lee, but the close-fitting apparel of the European must have been sadly uncomfortable in the heat of American summer, Nofuel, so probably it was. Stiff boxes of varying patterns adorned the heads of men. Curious jackets with tight sleeves compressed the body. The feet throbbed and burned in close-fitting casings of unyielding leather, and linen made stiff by artificial means was drawn tightly about the neck, Khan Lee, Allah. What idiots, Nofuel, even so are they considered, Khan, 
To what quality of their minds do you attribute such love of needless suffering, Nafnal? It was their desire to be like others. A natural feeling in a vulgar people, 15th May. A fair wind from the west today. We weighed anchor and sailed up the eastern side of the city. I did this as Nafnal finds the upper portion of the town much richer in relics than the lower, which seems to have been given up to commercial purposes. We sailed close under one of the great monuments in the river, and are at a loss to divine its meaning. Many iron rods still dangle from the tops of each of the structures. As they are in a line, one with the other, we thought at first they might have been once connected and served as a bridge, but we soon saw they were too far apart, came to anchor about three miles from the old mooring. Up the river and down, north, south, east, and west, the ruins stretch away indefinitely, seemingly without end, am anxious about level-headed. He went ashore and has not returned. It is now after midnight, 16th May. Praise Allah. My dear comrade is alive. This morning we landed early and began our search for him. As we passed before the building which bears the inscription, Dr. Astoria, upon its front, we heard his voice from within in answer to our calls. We entered, and after climbing the ruined stairway found him seated upon the floor above. He had a swollen leg from an ugly sprain, and various bruises were also his. While our friends were constructing a litter on which to bear him hence we conversed together. The walls about us bore traces of having once enclosed a hall of some beauty. In idling about I pulled open the decaying door of an old closet and saw upon the rotting shelves many pieces of glass and earth in well fine workmanship. Taking one in my hand, a small wine cup of glass, I approached my comrade calling his attention to its slender stem and curious form. As his eyes fell upon it they opened wide in amazement. I also observed a trembling of his hand as he reached forth to touch it. He then recounted to me his marvellous adventure of the night before, but saying before he began, Thou knowest, O Prince, I am no believer in visions, and I should never tell the tale but for thy discovery of this cup. I drank from such an one last night, proffered by a ghostly hand, I would have smiled, but he was much in earnest. As I made a movement to sit beside him, he said, Taste first, O my master, of the grapes hanging from yonder wall. I did so, and to my great surprise found them of an exquisite flavour, finer even than the cultivated fruit of Persia, sweeter and more delicate, of a different nature from the wild grapes we have been eating. My astonishment appeared to delight him, and he said with a laugh, The grapes are impossible, but they exist, even more absurd is my story. And he then narrated his adventure, it was this, what level-headed saw, yesterday, after nightfall. As he was hastening toward the slow tub he fell violently upon some blocks of stone, wrenching his ankle and much bruising himself. Unable to walk upon his foot he limped into this building to await our coming in the morning. The howling of wolves and other wild beasts as they prowled about the city drove him, for safety, to crawl up the ruins of the stairway to the floor above. As he settled himself in a corner of this hall his nostrils were greeted with a delicious odour from the grapes about his head. He found them surprisingly good, and ate heartily. He soon after fell into a sleep which lasted some hours, for when he awoke the moon was higher in the heavens, the voices of the wolves were hushed and the city was silent. As he lay in a reverie, much absorbed in his own thoughts, he gradually became aware of mysterious changes taking place, as if by stealth, about him. A decorated ceiling appeared to be closing over the hall. Mirrors and tinted walls slowly crept in place of ivy and crumbling bricks. A faint glow grew stronger and more intense until it filled the great room with a dazzling light. Then came softly into view a table of curious form, set out with flowers and innumerable dishes of glass and porcelain, as for a feast. Standing about the room he saw solemn men with beardless faces, all in black attire, whose garments bore triangular openings upon the chest to show the shirt beneath. These personages he soon discovered were servants, as he gazed in bewilderment, there entered other figures, two by two, who took their seats about the table. These later comers, sixty or more, were men and women walking arm in arm, the women in rich attire of unfamiliar fashion and sparkling with precious stones. The men were clad like the servants, they ate and drank and laughed, and formed a brilliant scene. Level-headed rose to his feet, and moved by a curiosity he made no effort to resist comma for he is a reckless fellow and knows no fear he hobbled out into the room. They looked upon him in surprise, and seemed much amused at his presence. One of the guests, a tall youth with yellow moustaches, approached him, Offering a delicate crystal vessel filled with a sparkling fluid, level-headed took it, the youth raised another from the table and with a slight gesture as if in salutation, he said in words which my comrade understood, though he swears it was a language unknown to him. 
we may meet again the fourth of next month. He then drank the wine, and so did level-headed, hereupon the others smiled as if at their comrade's wit, all save the women, whose tender faces spoke more of pity than of mirth. The wine flew to his brain as he drank it, and things about him seemed to reel and spin. Strains of fantastic music burst upon his ears, then, all in rhythm, the women joined their partners and whirled about him with a lightsome step. And, moving with it, his throbbing brain seemed dancing from his head. The room itself, LL swaying and quivering with the melody, grew dim and stole from view. The music softly died away, again was silence, the moon above looking calmly down upon the ivied walls, he fell like a drunken man upon the floor, and did not wake till our voices called him, such his tale, he is a clear head and is no liar, but so many grapes upon an empty stomach with a fever from his swollen limb might well explain it, bears meat for dinner, this morning toward noon Kuzandam, the second officer, wandered on ahead of us, and entered a large building in pursuit of a rabbit. He was about descending to the basement below, when he saw, close before him, a bear leisurely mounting the marble stairs. Kuzandam is no coward, but he turned and ran as he never ran before. The bear, who seemed of a sportive nature, also ran, and in close pursuit. Luckily for my friend we happened to be near, otherwise instead of our eating bear's meat, the bear might have lunched quietly off Kuzandam in the shady corridors of the Fifth Avenue Hotel. 17th May, today a scorching heat that burns the lungs. We started in the morning prepared to spend the night ashore, and explore the northern end of the city. It was a pleasant walk through the soft grass of the shady streets, but in those places unsheltered from the sun we were as fish upon a frying pan. Other dwellings we saw, even larger and more imposing than the one we entered yesterday. We were tempted to explore them, but level-headed wisely dissuaded us, saying the day was waxing hotter each hour and it could be done on our return. In the northern part of the town are many religious temples, with their tall towers like slender pyramids, tapering to a point. They are curious things, and surprisingly well preserved. The interiors of these temples are uninteresting. Nofiel says the religious rites of the Americans were devoid of character. There were many religious beliefs, all complicated and insignificant variations one from another, each sect having its own temples and refusing to believe as the others. This is amusing to a Persian but mayhap was a serious matter with them. One day in each week they assembled, the priests reading longer moral lectures written by themselves, with music by hired singers. They then separated, taking no thought of temple or priest for another seven days. Nofiel says they were not a religious people. That the temples were filled mostly with women, in the afternoon we found it necessary to traverse a vast pleasure ground. Now a wild forest, but with traces still visible of broad promenades and winding driveways. Obald thinks this must be the central pack sometimes alluded to in American literature, there remains an avenue of bronze statues, most of them yet upright and in good condition, but very comic. Level-headed and I still think them caricatures, but Nofuel is positive they were serious efforts, and says the Americans were easily pleased in matters of art, we lost our way in this park, having nothing to guide us as in the streets of the city. This was most happy, as otherwise we should have missed a surprising discovery, it occurred in this wise. Being somewhat overcome by the heat we halted upon a little hill to rest ourselves. While reclining beneath the trees I noticed unusual carvings upon a huge block against which level-headed was supporting his back. They were unlike any we had seen, and yet they were not unfamiliar. As I lay there gazing idly at them it flashed upon me they were Egyptian. We at once fell to examining the block, and found to our amazement an obelisk of Egyptian granite covered with Egyptian hieroglyphics of an antiquity exceeding by thousands of years the most ancient monuments of the country, verily, we were puzzled, when did the Egyptians invade America? Quoth Bozak as, with a solemn look, as if trying to recall a date, no Egyptian ever heard of America, said Nofuel. This obelisk was finished twenty centuries before the first American was weaned. In all probability it was brought here as a curiosity, just as we take to Persia the bronze head of George Washington. We spent much time over the monument, and I think Nofuel was disappointed that he could not bring it away with him. Also while in this park we came to a high tower, standing by itself, and climbed to the top, where we enjoyed a wide-spreading view. The extent of the city is astounding, miles away in the river lay the low tub, a white speck on the water. All about us in every direction as far as sight can reach were ruins, and ruins, and ruins. Never was a more melancholy sight. The blue sky, the bright sunshine, the sweet-scented air with the gay flowers and singing birds only made it sadder. They seemed a mockery, we have encamped for the night, and I can write no more. Countless flying insects gather about us with a hateful buzz, 
and bite us beyond endurance. They are a pest thrice accursed, I tell Nofiel his fine theory concerning the extinction of the Yankees is a good tale for those who have never been here. No man without a leather skin could survive a second night. 18th May, poor Akaz is worse than sick. He had an encounter last night with a strange animal, and his defeat was ignoble. The animal, a pretty thing, much like a kitten, was hovering near when Akaz, with rare courage and agility, threw himself upon it. And then what happened none of us can state with precision. We know we held our noses and fled. And Akaz. No words can fit him. He carries with him an odor to devastate a province. We had to leave him ashore and send him fresh raiment. This is, verily, a land of surprises. Our hands and faces still smart from the biting insects, and the perfume of the odorous kitten promises to be ever with us, Nofuel is happy. We have discovered hundreds of metal blocks, the poorest of which he asserts would be the gem of a museum. They were found by Fatan Lazy in the basement of a high building, all laid carefully away upon iron shelves. The flood of light they throw upon the manners and customs of this ludicrous people renders them of priceless value to historians. I harbor a suspicion that it causes Nofuel some pleasure to sit upon the cool deck of the Zayatub and watch Bozak has walking to and fro upon the ruins of a distant wharf. 19th May, the air is cooler. Griptil La thinks a storm is brewing, even Nofuel is puzzled over the wooden image we brought aboard yesterday. It is well preserved, with the barbaric coloring still fresh upon it. They found it standing upright in a little shop, how these idols were worshipped, and why they are found in little shops and never in the great temples is a mystery. It has a diadem of feathers on the head, and as we sat smoking upon the deck this evening I remarked to Nofuel that it might be the portrait of some American noble. Whereupon he said they had no nobles. But the Americans of gentle blood, I asked, had they no titles? Neither titles nor gentle blood, he answered. And as they were all of much the same origin, and came to this country simply to thrive more fatly than at home, there was nothing except difference in wealth on which to establish a superior order. Being deep respecters of money this was a satisfying distinction. It soon resulted that those families who possessed riches for a generation or two became the substitute for an aristocracy. This upper class was given to sports and pastimes, spending their wealth freely, being prodigiously fond of display. Their intellectual development was feeble, and they wielded but little influence save in social matters. They followed closely the fashions of foreign aristocracies. Great attentions were paid to wandering nobles from other lands. Even distant relatives of titled people were greeted with the warmest enthusiasm, then I said to him, But explain to me, O oh Nofuel, how it was possible for so shallow a nation to become so great, they were great only in numbers and too weak to endure success. At the beginning of the twentieth century as they counted time huge fortunes were amassed in a day, and the Americans became drunk with money, whereupon I exclaimed, O oh land of delight! For much money is cheering, but the old man shook his head. Very true, O oh Prince! But the effect was woeful. These vast fortunes soon dominated all things, even the seat of government and the courts of justice. Tricks of finance brought fabulous gains. Young men became demoralized. For sober industry with its moderate profits was ridiculed, verily, that would be natural. I said. But in a land where all were rich who was found to cook and scrub, to fetch and carry and to till the soil? For none will shovel earth when his pockets are stuffed with gold, all were not rich. And when the poor also became greedy they became hostile. Then began social upheavals with bloodshed and havoc. 20th May. An icy wind from the northeast with a violent train. Yesterday we gasped with the hot air. Today we are shivering in winter clothing. 2 LST May. The same as yesterday. Most of us are ill. My teeth chatter and my body is both hot and cold. A storm more wicked never wailed about a ship. Level-headed calls it the shrieking voices of the hundred millions of Americans who must have perished in similar weather. 16th June, it is many days since I have touched this journal. A hateful sickness has been upon me, destroying all energy and courage. A sort of fever, and yet my limbs were cold. I could not describe it if I would. Nofuel came into the cabin this evening with some of his metal plates and discoursed upon them. He has no respect for the intellects of the early Americans. I thought for a moment I had caught him in a contradiction but he was right as usual. It was thus, Nofuel. They were great readers, Khan Lee. You have told us they had no literature. Were they great readers of nothing, Nofuel? Verily, thou hast said it. Vast sheets of paper were published daily in which all crimes were recorded in detail. The more revolting the deed, the more minute the description. Horrors were their chief delight. Scandals were drunk in with thirstful eyes. 
These chronicles of crime and filth were issued by hundreds of thousands. There was hardly a family in the land but had one, Khan Lee. And did this take the place of literature, Nafu? Even so, 20th June. Once more we are on the sea, two days from New York. Our decision was a sudden one. Nofuel, in an evil moment, found among those accursed plates a map of the country, and thereupon was seized with an unreasoning desire to visit a town called Washington. I wavered and at last consented, foolishly I believe, for the crew allowed for Persia. And this town is inland on a river. He says it was their finest city, the seat of government, the capital of the country. Grip till Lars swears he can find it if the map is truthful. Akaz still eats by himself, this afternoon we reclined upon the deck, the slow tub drifting gently in a southerly direction. Land could be seen on the starboard bow, a faint strip along the western horizon, it was about the middle of the afternoon, while passing the ruins of a gigantic tower perhaps a lighthouse that Nofuel, of a sudden, clambered hastily to his feet and looked about him. Then he called to Griptilla, asking how many leagues we were from the harbour of New York. Griptilla's reply I forget but it filled the old man with a gentle excitement. I observed an unwonted sparkle in his eyes, also a quivering of the fingers as he pointed to the ocean around about, and exclaimed, Beneath us, the bottom of the sea is covered with iron ships the wrecks of stupendous navies the mightiest of all human history. At once we all became interested. What navies? I inquired. And what compassed their destruction? Was it a battle, Nofuel? A battle of whose magnitude no Persian has conception a conflict in which the sea was tossed and the heavens rent by thunderings of iron monsters. Any one of them would have blown to atoms a fleet of slow tubs, Adel Pate. Verily. A Talesia told and believed. But I would readily venture my head in the slow tub against any of these nursery tale wonders, Nofuel. And with wisdom. For the loss of thy brain. Adel Pate, could not affect the nature of thy speech, whereupon there was laughter, and Adel Pate held his peace, Khan Lee. But tell us of this battle. Oh Nofuel. I remember now to have read about it at college. These details of ancient history I am prone to forget. How came it about, Nofuel? I have spoken of the Americans being a greedy race. And their greed, at last, resulted in this war. By means of one-sided laws of their own making they secured for themselves a lion's share of all profits from the world's commerce. This checked the prosperity of other nations until at last the leading powers of Europe combined in self-defense against this all-absorbing greed. They collected an armada the like of which was never imagined, neither before nor since. Then, across the ocean, came the Iron Host. And here, upon this very spot where we are floating, they met the American ships, Khan Lee. How many ships in all, Nofuel? The Americans had 80 heavy ships of iron, with a number of smaller craft. The Allies had 240 heavy battleships, all of iron. They also had smaller craft for divers' purposes, Khan Lee. Allah! A bad prospect for our greedy friends. And being a nation of traders they had no liking, probably, for the perils of war, Nofuel. As to that historians differ. According to the Americans themselves they were mighty warriors. But certain writers of that period give a different impression. Nozdal is sure they were cowards, weak in body as in spirit, but often favored by fortune. In my opinion. This battle throws considerable light upon that matter. A day like this, it was, also in June, as the Europeans, coming northward along the coast to seize New York, met the American Admiral Nefarsaidi with his eighty ships. And the struggle was short, Khan Lee. Verily, I can believe it. With three ships to one I would give the Europeans about half a day a summer afternoon like this to send the greedy ones to the bottom, Nofuel. Thy guess is good, O oh Prince, as to the hours of fighting. It lasted just one summer afternoon. But the Americans it was who sent their enemies to the bottom. And the sea beneath our feet is strewn with iron hulks, Khan Lee. Bismillah. If that be a true tale and I doubt it not these greedy ones were not so contemptible, at least when there was profit in it, level-headed. At what period did this occur, Nofuel? Early in the twentieth century. I cannot recall the date, but it was never forgotten by the Americans. Surely a just pride, for on that day they accomplished wonders. The Admiral Nefar Saidi on his ship the Tazen Stripes was at one time surrounded by a dozen German men of war. And lo! He demolished all. And of Frank and Russian vessels he put an end to as many more, also sundry Italians and British, level-headed. Bismillah. But that was good. What, O oh Nofuel, is the Persian of that name's Tazen Stripes, Nofuel? None can tell with certainty. To the Americans it signified victory, or something similar. Other miracles were achieved by the Americans that day. 
no fleas me, a little craft with a pointed brow, jammed holes in nearly a score of monster ships, and the waters closed over them. There figured also along a narrow boat of American devising, the Yankee de Oodle. This astonishing machine sailed to and fro among the foreign ships upsetting all traditions. Much glory befell her commander. The captain who awry boys. Gripped ill la. And how many ships did the Americans lose, no fuel? Reports are contradictory. According to one of their own writers of the period they suffered no loss whatever in vessels. Yet at the same time he asserts, we gave them Hal Columbia, which must be the name of a ship, Khan Lee. A gallant fight. But can you explain how such an inferior people could become heroic of a sudden, no fuel? According to Ardfax, an early British historian, they were addicted to surprising feats upon the water. And this statement is borne out by a Spanish admiral, Offelbad Shooter, who maintains that the Americans, being a godless people, raided by the devil, 2d July, we are on the river that leads to Washington. Grip till La says we shall sight it tomorrow. The river is a dirty color, 3d July. We see ahead of us the ruins of a great dome, also a very high shaft. Probably they belong to the city we seek, 4th July, a date we shall not forget. Little did I realize this morning when we left this low tub in such hilarious mood what dire events awaited us. I landed about noon, accompanied by Nofuel, Lavella headed, Bozakas, Adel Pate, Q's and Dam the first mate, Tickle Pallet the cook, for Tanlays A, and two sailors. Our march had scarce begun when a startling discovery caused great commotion in our minds. We had halted at Nofuel's request, to decipher the inscription upon a stone, when Lavella headed, who had started on, stopped short with a sudden exclamation. We hastened to him, and there, in the soft earth, was the imprint of human feet. I cannot describe our surprise. We decided to follow the footprints, and soon found they were leading us toward the great dome more directly than we could have gone ourselves. Our excitement was beyond words. Those of us who had weapons carried them in readiness. The path was little used, but clearly marked. It wound about among fallen fragments and grumbling statues, and took us along a wide avenue between buildings of vast size and solidity, far superior to any we had seen in New York. It seemed a city of monuments. As we ascended the hill to the great temple and saw it through the trees rising high above us, we were much impressed by its vast size and beauty. Our eyes wandered in admiration over the massive columns, each hewn from a single block, still white and fresh as if newly quarried. The path took us under one of the lower arches of the building, and we emerged upon the other side. This front we found even more beautiful than the one facing the city. At the center was a flight of steps of magnificent proportions, now falling asunder and overgrown in many places with grass and flowers. These steps we ascended. As I climbed silently up, the others following, I saw two human feet the souls toward us, resting upon the balustrade above. With a gesture I directed Nofuel's attention to them, and the old man's eyes twinkled with delight. Was it American? I confessed to a lively excitement at the prospect of meeting one. How many were they? And how would they treat us? Looking down upon my little band to see that all were there, I boldly marched up the remaining steps and stood before him. He was reclining upon a curious little four-legged seat, with his feet upon the balustrade, about on a level with his head. Clad in skins and rough cloth he looked much like a hunter, and he gazed quietly upon me, as though a Persian noble were a daily guest. Such a reception was not gratifying, especially as he remained in the same position, not even withdrawing his feet. He nodded his curious head down once and up again, deeming it apparently a sufficient salutation. The maintenance of my own dignity before my followers forbade my standing thus before a seated barbarian, and I made a gesture for him to rise. This he answered in an unseemly manner by ejecting from his mouth a brownish fluid, projecting it over and beyond the balustrade in front of him. Then looking upon me as if about to laugh, and yet with a grave face, he uttered something in an unmusical voice which I failed to understand. Upon this Nofuel, who had caught the meaning of one or two words, stepped hastily forward and addressed him in his own language. But the barbarian understood with difficulty and they had much trouble in conversing, chiefly from reason of Nofuel's pronunciation. He afterward told me that this man's language differed but little from that of the Americans, as they wrote it eleven centuries ago. When he finally arose in talking with Nofuel I could better observe him. He was tall and bony, with an awkward neck, and appeared at first glance to be a man of forty years. We decided later he was under thirty. His yellow skin and want of hair made him seem much older than he was. I was also much puzzled by the expression of his face. It was one of deep sadness, yet his eyes were full of mirth and a corner of his mouth was ever drawing up as if in mockery. 
For myself I liked not his manner. He appeared little impressed by so many strangers, and bore himself as though it were of small importance whether we understood him or not. But Nofiel since informed me that he asked a multitude of questions concerning us, what Nofiel gathered was this. This American with his wife and one old man were all that remained of his race. Thirty-one had died this summer. In ancient times there were many millions of his countrymen. They were the greatest nation upon the earth. He could not read. He had two names, one was John, the other he had forgotten. They lived in this temple because it was cool. When the temple was built, and for what purpose, he could not tell. He pointed to the west and said the country in that direction was covered with ruined cities. When Nofiel told him we were friends, and presented him at my direction with a hunting knife of fine workmanship, he pushed out his right arm toward me and held it there. For an instant Nofiel looked at the arm wonderingly, as did we all, then with sudden intelligence he seized the outstretched hand in his own, and moved it up and down. This was interesting, for Nofiel tells me it was a form of greeting among the ancient Americans. While all this was going on we had moved into the great circular hall beneath the dome. This hall was of vast proportions and there were still traces of its former splendor. Against the walls were marble statues entwined in ivy, looking down upon us with melancholy eyes. Here also we met a thin old man, whose hairless head and beardless face almost moved us to mirth. At Nofiel's request our host led the way into some of the smaller rooms to show us their manner of living, and it would be impossible to imagine a more pathetic mixture of glory and decay, of wealth and poverty, of civilization and barbarity. Old furniture, dishes of silver, Bronze images, even paintings and ornaments of great value were scattered through the rooms, side by side with the most primitive implements. It was plain the ancient arts were long since forgotten. When we returned to the circular hall our host disappeared for a few moments into the room which he had not shown us. He came back bringing a stone vase with a narrow neck, and was followed by a maiden who bore drinking cups of copper and tin. These she deposited upon a fallen fragment of a dome which served as a table. This girl was interesting. A dainty head delicate features, yellow hair, blue eyes, and a gentle sadness of mien that touched my heart. Had she been ugly what a different ending to this day. We all saluted her, and the American spoke a few words which we interpreted as a presentation. He filled the cups from the stone vase, and then saying something which Nofuel failed to catch. He held his cup before his face with a peculiar movement and put it to his lips. As he did this level-headed clutched my arm and exclaimed, the very gesture of the ghost and then as if to himself, and this is July 4th, but he drank, as did we all, for our thirst was great and the odor of the golden liquid was most alluring. It tasted hotter than the fires of Gelbus. It was also of great potency and gave a fine exhilaration to the senses. We became happier at once, and here it was that Akaz did a fatal thing. Being near the maid and much affected by her beauty, he addressed her as her Almissa, the most angelic of women, which, of course, she understood not. This were well had he gone no further, but he next put his arm about her waist with intent to kiss her. Much terrified, she tried to free herself. But Hakaz, holding her fair chin with his other hand, had brought his lips almost to hers when the old man raised his heavy staff and brought it down upon our comrade's head with cruel swiftness. This falling stick upon a solid skull resumed it about the dome and echoed through the empty corridors. Bozak has blinked and staggered back, then, with fury in his face, he sprang savagely toward the aged man, but here the young American interfered. Rapidly approaching them and shutting tight his bony hand, he shot it from him with startling velocity, so directing that it came in contact with the face of Akaz who, to our amazement, sat roughly upon the marble pavement, the blood streaming from his nostrils. He was a pitiful sight, unaccustomed to such warfare we were seriously alarmed, and thought him killed perhaps. Adel Pate, a mighty wrestler, and of powerful build rushed furiously upon the American for whom I trembled. But his arm again went out before him, and Adel Pate likewise sat. A mournful spectacle, and every Persian felt his heart beat fast within him. By this time Akaz was on his feet again, purple with rage. With uplifted scimitar he sprang toward our host. The old man stepped between. Akaz, with wanton cruelty, brought his steel upon the ancient head, and stretched him upon the floor. For an instant the younger one stood horror-stricken, then snatching from the floor the patriarch's staff a heavy stick with an iron end he jumped forward, and, quicker than words can tell it, dealt a frightful blow upon the head of Akaz which sent him headlong to the ground with a broken skull. All this had happened in a moment, and wild confusion followed. My followers drew their arms and rushed upon the American. 
The girl ran forward either from terror or to shield her spouse, I know not which, when a flying arrow from a sailor's crossbow pierced her to the heart, this gave the American the energy of twenty men. He knocked brave Q's and damn senseless with a blow that would have killed an ox. Such fury I had not conceived. He brought his flying staff like a thunderbolt from heaven upon the Persian skulls, yet always edging toward the door to prevent his enemies surrounding him. Four of our number, in as many minutes, joined Akaz upon the floor. Kuzandam, Adelpate, Fatanlays, A, and Hartak, a sailor, lay stretched upon the pavement, all dead or grievously wounded. So suddenly had this taken place, that I hardly realized what had happened. I rushed forward to stay the combat, but he mistook the purpose struck my scimitar with a force that sent it flying through the air, and had raised his staff to deal a second for myself, when brave level-headed stepped in to save me, and thrust quickly at him. But alas! The American warded off his stroke with one yet quicker, and brought his stick so swiftly against my comrade's head that it laid him with the others. When level-headed fell I saw the American had many wounds, for my comrades had made a savage onslaught. He tottered as he moved back into the doorway, where he leaned against the wall for an instant his eyes meeting ours with a look of defiance and contempt that I would willingly forget. Then the staff dropped from his hand. He staggered out to the great portico, and fell his length upon the pavement. Nofuel hastened to him, but he was dead. As he fell a wonderful thing took place an impossible thing, as I look back upon it, but both Nofuel and I saw it distinctly. In front of the great steps and facing this doorway is a large sitting image of George Washington. As the American staggered out upon the porch, his hands outstretched before him and with death at his heart, this statue slowly bowed its head as if in recognition of a gallant fight. Perhaps it was the sorrowful acceptance of a bitter ending. 7th July. Again upon the sea, this time for Persia, bearing our wounded and the ashes of the dead, those of the natives are reposing beneath the great temple. The skull of the last American I shall present to the museum at Tehran, 